Today we're going to talk about the Antichrist. Anti means uh, in opposition to or opposite of. Uh, sometimes it means in place of. Christ means anointed one, so Antichrist is in opposition to the anointed one or uh, in place of the anointed one. The Antichrist figure looms large in the last day's madness crowd. Uh, the Antichrist is often conflated with the beast of Revelation, and understandably so, uh, but they are not the same thing uh, in, my, in, in my reading. Uh, the beasts are political in nature, and we went over this already. You have the political leaders in Rome uh, with the sea beast and the political leaders um, in Israel with the land beast. Uh, and as we will see, uh, the Antichrist is more religious in nature. So I think that the false prophet that accompanies the land beast uh, in Revelation, we could ascribe the moniker of Antichrist to him. Uh, but the term Antichrist is actually not used in Revelation. It's only used in uh, John's letters. Sometimes the Antichrist is conflated with the uh, man of lawlessness or the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians, uh, which I believe is Titus, uh, but most people believe is a future um, figure. But again, not explicitly called the Antichrist, and these are often just collapsed into one uh, figure by the, the last days kind of dispensational madness crowd. So um, this is a popular thought. This is a popular thought in, in, in culture, in pop culture. And oftentimes it's a single man in the future, um, uh, meaning a singular man, who is going to somehow unite the nations and uh, he's going to be some kind of charismatic figure, uh, often political, but maybe sometimes prophetic. And um, he is going to set himself up in the place of uh, Christ. That's, that's, how, that's the popular conception. Uh, many of the reformers, um, even, it worked even in the in Westminster Confession and in, in, in a lot of their writings, said that the Pope, so the Bishop of Rome, was the Antichrist. Um, now, I'm not convinced that any of these, there may be modicums of truth to some of these things, but I'm not convinced that that's what John is um, talking about. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, John's apocalypse, the Antichrist, is not mentioned by name, but in John's letters, he's mentioned by name. In the first letter, uh, Antichrist is mentioned four times, and in his second letter, it's mentioned uh, once, a uh, total of five times, so all of them in John's letters. Uh, in the first letter, which we read for our, re our, our reading, uh, there's a few things to note, and the first one is this. It's the time reference. This is for what we're doing here. It's undeniably preteristic. Um, uh, there might be some kind of, be, since all of history is typologically related, there might be something in the future, but that's not what John is saying. Um, it's very clear. What does he say? He says, it's the last hour. Again, last day's language. Um, I'm not going to get into this, but uh, it's an interesting study in trying to harmonize what Jesus says when he says nobody will know the day or hour, and John says it's the last hour. Um, so that can be harmonized, but we won't get into that. Um, but, but this all harmonizes with everything we've read up to this point where all of the apostles uh, and Jesus himself are situating themselves in the last days, in the end, end of the ages, in the last times. And he says this, he says, you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many antichrists have, have come, by which we know that is the last hour. So the appearance of the antichrist, which he says are now, which means in his time, 2,000 years ago, is a sign of the last hour. Um, so I, I don't mean to belabor this point, but I am. Uh, there's little to no ambiguity about the preteristic um, uh, time frame of the fulfillment of this. It is happening in John's time. So it's quite remarkable how in popular conceptions, this isn't even considered that the Antichrist had already come or the Antichrist. So furthermore, he describes the Antichrist as going out from us, right? Going out from us, meaning the apostles. So they, they had to have been people who lived then. They, they might have been discipled or converted uh, under the apostles' preaching and teaching, but they had apostatized. They had went out from us, but they were not of us. 
Uh, again, this is a pretty famous Calvinistic proof text, and we're not going to get into that, but uh, we would all affirm that you can taste the heavenly gifts, and uh, you can partake of the Holy Spirit, uh, as Hebrews says, and you can fall away, and that's what these men uh, were, were doing. Um, Again, they went out from us. It's placing the Antichrist contemporaneously with the apostles. He also later says, these things I have written to you concerning those trying to deceive you. The, the, and these are about the Antichrist. They are trying to deceive the people that he's writing the letters to. Preteristic interpretation once again. Um, and then uh, later in chapter four, he says this. Uh, the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So it's a reiteration of what he had said before. But again, uh, they've been warmed up, warned of it and they are now living in it. Antichrist is already in John's world. And then... In his second letter, he repeats this once again, 2 John 1, 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So these deceivers and these antichrists have already entered the last hour world of the first century. Okay. That's, that, it's all over the place. So I just, I wanted to go through those and uh, uh, show when the Antichrist was coming. And the second thing to note is that John uses both the singular and the plural with Antichrist. He says, you've been warned of the Antichrist, and even now many Antichrists uh, have come. So uh, I think the way that we can conceive of this is that later in John, he's talking about uh, judging spirits and not being deceived by spirits. Translations will often say the spirit of Antichrist, which is um, an interjection. The word spirit isn't in there. He describes the spirit of Antichrist um, and he says, this is the Antichrist. But, but the, the interpreter, I think, is probably taking too much liberty, but they're still right, saying this is the spirit of Antichrist. And that is how I think we can conceive of this when he uses Antichrist in the singular, uh, it is the spirit of Antichrist, and they manifest in the many Antichrists that have gone out, which are uh, particular men uh, in, his, in his time, who are, who are uh, these Antichrists are Antichrists depending on what uh, they're teaching. And that's the, the third point I want to bring up. What, what are they teaching? What are the Antichrists teaching? Well, he tells us. John says the, the same thing in many different ways. And um, I'll just uh, I'll summarize um, a few of them. He says the Antichrist is contrary to apostolic teaching. He says the Antichrist denies the Father and the Son. John, by implication, says the Antichrists are liars and that they lie when they deny that Jesus is the Christ. And then this is the big one that he repeats quite a bit. And I think this is kind of the, the, the locus of the, of the Antichrist teaching. The Antichrist does not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That one's said twice. It's uh, once in John's first letter and then it's discussed again in his second. So there's many, there's many facets here, but uh, it's not that complicated. I would, I would sum up the Antichrist teachings as somehow denying Christ's humanity or his divinity in some form. That is, that is how I would summarize the Antichrist uh, teachings that we see here from uh, John. And these are precisely the heresies that we see among the heretics of the first few centuries, especially the Docetists. Uh, we've mentioned Gnostics. Docetists would be a, a kind of a, a, a subgenre where they would say Jesus appeared to be a man, but he was really a phantom. He wasn't, he didn't actually come in the flesh. Um, and that's a, that was a pretty prominent teaching that most people consider John to be anticipating. These proto-Gnostic tendencies um, is, uh, it's, there's a general consensus among scholars that John's work in general, the gospels and these writings are anticipating these, these Gnostic and particularly Docetic uh, tendencies. You see here, um, 
it, well, how does he begin uh, the Gospel of John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it's amazing because John is the gospel who's known for emphasizing the, the, the divinity of Christ, Christ's uh, divinity, but he's also emphasizing that he came in the flesh. And so we have um, John really hammering this home. And, and at the beginning of his first letter, he's emphatic about this as well. Uh, the letter that we read, if the very opening, he says, uh, I'm writing to you about what we have seen with our eyes and what we've heard and what we have handled and touched. Uh, and he's talking about the word of life, who is Jesus. And so he's emphasizing, we have touched this man and we have fellowship with him. And um, uh, so I, I would say uh, these are, um, he's fighting against teachings that say Jesus was uh, only, um, he was an inspired prophet or, or maybe um, the, the, the divinity of Christ touched down on him for a moment and then parted. Uh, th these Gnostic teachers taught all kinds of things like this. And this is the war uh, that uh, the early fathers had fought um, in the first few centuries of the church. And what this comes down to is, is, is Jesus Yahweh God or not? That's all, that's, all of this boils down to that. Is he Yahweh or not? Um, is he the, the, the eternal living God or not? And we'll get back to that. Um, we talk about Gnostics a lot. I, we, I mention them a lot. I kind of give maybe a short kind of description of what um, they're teaching. But I'd like to share a passage from Irenaeus to kind of give us handles on what, what are these Gnostics talking about? What are they teaching? Most of the Gnostic beliefs that we have come from Irenaeus. We, I don't know if we have any original writings from the Gnostics. We're getting it all from Christians who are trashing the Gnostics. So that's how we know what they uh, believed. Um, uh, and I think that they are, they are certainly more trustworthy um, in, in um, you know, framing their, the opponent's arguments. OK, um, Irenaeus, this, oh, a quick, quick background here. Um, he is, Irenaeus is said to have heard the teachings of Polycarp, and Polycarp is said to have heard the teachings of John. So, and we have this, from John to Polycarp to Irenaeus, this pushing against Gnosticism and this emphasis on the full deity of Christ. And um, speaking of the Gnostics, Irenaeus says this. He says, according to these men, neither was the word made flesh, nor Christ, nor the Savior, who was produced from the joint contributions of all the aeons. And these Gnostics have all of these for, this foreign cosmology that they bring in uh, to, they try to pair it with Christianity. <clears throat> and that's what he's talking about here. And it's really like God at the top and all these things of God consciousness and the creation is way down here. It's a very complicated kind of system, but that's what he is referring to there. For they will have it that the word in Christ never came into this world, that the Savior, too, never became incarnate nor suffered, but that he descended like a dove upon the dispensational Jesus, and that as soon as he had declared uh, the unknown Father, he did again ascend into the Pleroma. And the Pleroma is kind of like the highest heavens in their, in their schema, kind of the essence of God. And so he's saying a part of God this, that they're calling Christ and the Savior descended on him at his baptism, caused him to uh, pronounce things concerning the Father, and then, it, and then it lifted again. According to the opinion of no one of the heretics was the word of God made flesh. For if anyone carefully examines the systems of them all, he will find that the word of God is brought in by all of them as not having become incarnate and impassable, as is also the Christ from above. Others consider him to have been manifested as a transfigured man, but they maintain him to have been neither born nor to have become incarnate. While others hold that he did not assume a human form at all, but that as a dove he did descend upon that Jesus who was born from Mary. Therefore, the Lord's disciple, and he means John, pointing them all out as false witnesses says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. 
And so this, this goes all the way back to what John is saying here. I wanted to share a, another story. Irenaeus relates um, that John, um, uh, oh, well, yeah, real quickly. Yeah, he says that John sought by proclamation of his gospel, oh, to remove the error which by Serenthus had been disseminated among men. I didn't have the, the uh, section title here. But Serenthus is um, sometimes by Preterist considered to be the Antichrist of that day because he was a leader of, uh, of one of these Gnostic movements, maybe the, the, the Docetic movement. Um, but uh, Irenaeus is telling us that John is seeking to refute him by writing the Gospel uh, of John. Um, so I, I want to relay one, one more uh, passage here from Irenaeus. It's a, it's a, he's relaying a story from Polycarp about John and how John and Serenthus related to each other. Okay? He says, there are also those who heard from him, meaning Polycarp, that John, the disciple of the Lord, going to bathe at Ephesus and perceiving Serenthus within, rushed out of the bathhouse without bathing, exclaiming, let us fly, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Serenthus, the enemy of truth, is within. I think some of us can, can relate to this. And Polycarp himself replied to Marcion, who met him on one occasion, and Marcion said, do you know who I am? And then Polycarp replies, I do know who you are. You are the firstborn of Satan. And then listen to this. Listen to what Irenaeus says. Such was the horror which the apostles and their disciples had against holding even verbal communication with any corruptors of the truth. As Paul also says, and he quotes Paul, a man that is a heretic, and that, that word heretic sometimes in our, um, our translations It'll be uh, like a, a dissenter or a schismatic, um, uh, but that's, yeah. A man that is a heretic, somebody who's breaking off from, from what's been handed down to us from the apostles. After the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that, uh, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sins being condemned of himself, which is Titus 3.10. Mm -hmm. So I share this with you to encourage you all who have done similar things, cutting off verbal communication to those corruptors of truth. We may not be dealing with, with uh, docetists, but we are dealing with people who are opposing Christ who claim to be Christians. And so that's what I want to talk about. That's what I kind of uh, uh, contemporary antichrist. If, if the antichrist spirit is one which denies that Jesus is the Christ. That's one way he describes it. Who, who might be some contemporary antichrist in our own day? That's a good one. Jordan Peterson. Um, now I think uh, I, would, I would put it more on y Jung and Freud, but he is pushing Jung and Freud where um, they would view Christ as a uh, idea or a concept, um, an, an allegory for the perfect man. And, and these things exist as types and abstractions. Um, and maybe Jesus was a man who existed in history, but he certainly wasn't God. Um, uh, and so this kind of separation of the, the historical Christ uh, and viewing it as an abstraction, denying that he came in the flesh and just making it this idea. That's a good one. That is, and then I would say the father, sometimes uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher, or Macher, is, um, he's a theologian, a German theologian in the 19th century, sometimes called the father of liberalism. And he started reading the scriptures in this kind of way, where the resurrection is really kind of a moral epiphany that you might have. Or uh, Christ wasn't really God, but he, was so, he had such a strong God consciousness is how he would describe it. And, and all of these ideas are diminishing the historical reality of Christ and that Christ was a man and also fully God. So that's a good one. That's a good one. Any, any, any other one? Mormons. Mormons, boom. That's, in my mind, Mormonism is 
the modern docetism of our day. They have this foreign cosmology. They say that God the Father used to be a man like us. Let me read this really quick. Joseph Smith, um, so first of all, he's denying what our fathers had fought for um, in confessing the Trinity. Uh, Joseph Smith has a demon appear to him and he thinks it's an angel. Um, he thinks it's God. And he says, what, what denomination should I join? And he writes this, I was answered that I must join none of them for they were all wrong. And the personage, the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight. Well, what do we just confess the creed? Is that an abomination? Right? That Jesus, Jesus is God um, is an abomination to uh, Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith, in one of his sermons, he wrote this. He says, God himself was once as we are now. He's talking about God the Father. And is an exalted man, and he sits enthroned in yonder heavens. I like the old language there. That is the great secret. And that's very similar to the Gnostics. Gnostic means knowledge. And they have the secret knowledge of who God really is. And they were pulling Christians away into all these whack, whacked out <laughs> pipe dreams that they came up with. And that's what Mormonism is. Um, he goes, I am going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so, the, so that you may see that he was once a man like us. Yea, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth. And he has God the father, uh, I think on a, a planet called Molob or something, having spirit babies who you once were and then you manifested now. And so, does any of that sound familiar? Is that in scripture? No. These are uh, extra biblical revelations opposed to scripture for the purpose of, of bringing in a new gospel. And it's really quite remarkable because Paul warns this. He goes, even if an angel from heaven teaches you a different gospel than the one I've given you, reject it. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph Smith. That's really good. Um, any others? Jehovah's Jeho Charles Taze Russell, Jehovah's Witnesses, great. Just flat out denies the, the full divinity of Christ. They're Arians. Um, maybe not in the exact same way as, as Arius was, um, but yeah, that's, the, uh, that's another really good one as well. Um, let's see here. A couple others, and this, this does get tough because it's like, in its broadest sense, we might say, well, all unbelievers are antichrist because they're opposed to Christ. But I don't think that's what John is getting at. I think John is getting at something more like Jehovah's Witnesses or, or Mormons. But I would say maybe kind of a middle ground. Who's another, what's another big group that, that denies that Jesus is the Christ? There's two, two ones. There's two of them. Atheists. Atheists would be one, yeah. How about ones that are religious, that, are, that share with us certain things? The Jews. The Jews, right. They deny that Jesus is the Christ. Um, they still hold to the Old Testament, um, but they deny that Jesus is the Christ. So I think there is something to be said there. Uh, John, Jesus says through John in Revelation that those who say that they're Jews lie, and they're not really Jews, that it's a synagogue of Satan. There's not very pleasant things said about those who denied the Jews who denied the Messiah in Scripture. So that's that's another one. And then the last one I would say uh, would be uh, Islam. Yeah, the prophet Muhammad curses be upon him. He he came and he uh, he again saw an angel and he wrote the Quran. And in the Quran, I think I think Jesus is mentioned. Uh, more than Muhammad himself. Um, it's in there a lot, but he's just another prophet. And he denies that Jesus died on the cross. He appears to have died, or there's some other kind of explanation. But you talk to, I've talked to Muslims a lot um, who are here, and, and just your average Muslim is repulsed by the idea that he would become a man, particularly that he would be born of a woman. Like that is, that is gross to them. 
And so there, there's, I think, an antichrist spirit uh, there with, uh, with Muslims. Oftentimes you hear, um, you hear whenever the prophet Muhammad is mentioned, you'll hear them say, peace be upon him. So just under your breath, curses be upon him. Um, because he's an antichrist. You have, um, let's see here. I think those are the main ones, yeah. Okay, so these teachers and their beliefs are antichrist because they deny that Christ came in the flesh, meaning they don't believe that Jesus is God or that Jesus is the Messiah. They cannot say with Thomas, and John records this for us, my Lord and my God, right? That's what Thomas says at the end of John's gospel. They can't say that, not in its fullest sense, not in who God really is. They purposely misconstrue and overtly deny Jesus' humanity and divinity. It's, it's really remarkable. And that, that's what our early fathers fought for. That's what all these creeds are about. And I would say, I would back it up, what, what I said before. Really, this, this isn't complicated. This goes all the way back. And we're, we're in Genesis. We're in the Old Testament. This goes back to who is Yahweh? Who is the I Am? That's what this is, because Yahweh is the creator God, the eternal God. That is who this is. And John, in his gospel, he says 10 times, 9 times, there's 7 of them that are metaphorical uses, and then 2 or 3 that are different, that Jesus is the I Am. He put, Jesus is, he's saying this in John's gospel. Jesus identifies himself as the I Am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Before Abraham was, I am. And when the chief priests and soldiers came to arrest him in the garden, it's a recapitulation of the Garden of Eden, they see, Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And our, our translations totally mess it, mess it up because he says, I am he. But he just says, I am. I am. And they fall to the ground. There's like, it's like John's building up to this. I am. Boom. And he's like standing over them. And he's like, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I already told you that I am. He is the eternal, everlasting God, without beginning or end, the creator of all things, who entered into full humanity with a true body that sweat and wept and bled. And this is what our patrimony fought to defend. And we continue to confess with Thomas, the Catholic and evangelical faith, that Jesus is our Lord and our God. Let's pray. After warning of the Antichrist, John says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house or greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So the charge is this. Do not receive or even greet the Antichrist. This takes spirit-led wisdom because we are also called to evangelize the lost. So we need to distinguish between lost sheep and wolves in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. At some point, one must make the judgment that our bishop stated recently. These people don't need to be won over. They need to be defeated. Mm -hmm. And you defeat them with new covenant violence. Do not receive them. Do not greet them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.